What do you do when you're asked to fill space under a time of prayer? Maybe it's a spontaneous moment that you haven't been able to practice or prepare for specifically. You want to avoid a deer in the headlights moment. You don't want to get in the way or distract, but you also want to contribute something and enhance the ministry that's happening. Well, that's what this video is all about, how to underscore and play underneath your pastor. Joy from Sunday Sounds is an expert at this. And Joy, I'm excited to have you with us today to talk about how you like to approach it. This is sort of a scary topic for a lot of people, especially because it's typically spontaneous, right? So I wondered if you had a story of a time when you've been asked to underscore and share how that went for you. So I'm actually reminded of a time where I thought we were just going right into the next song. And so I started to play a little repetitive melodic riff that kind of moves at a clip that I like to do for Build My Life. And so it kind of starts in the intro and carries us right nicely through into the verse. And right as I start to play that, I hear my worship leaders start to share, and he's talking to everyone in the room, and then he's starting to pray, and he's starting to read a scripture and all these things. And so right when he begins that, I thought, oh gosh, we're into a new moment that I didn't expect. So you're (laughs) stuck in the riff. So I'm in the riff, right? and I'm with the click track, and I'm playing the riff, and I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, I don't know how long this moment is gonna last, and I've already started this riff. And so in that moment, I'm like, okay, I have a decision. I'm playing this part that's busier than I would like it to be. But do I pull back or try to slowly pull back and play some chords or do I just keep going in the middle of this moment? And so I decided just, I'm going to keep going. I felt like it would be more distracting to just stop. So I keep going and this is going for a while. It was probably five or six minutes before he finally comes back in and starts singing the next song. Right. And so it was really cool though, because at the end of the service, I talked to some other people in the room and just said, you know, was it too loud in the house? Was it busy? Was it distracting? They're like, no, actually it was just right. It was exactly what the moment needed in that particular case. And it just really set the tone. And so I just think underscoring is such a challenging thing because you do have to make all these split second decisions all the time. So I just feel like when you're more confident, you can practice at home and feel good about it. And when you can take some of these safer risks on stage, Mm -hmm. I just feel like you're more and more confident to make all these really quick decisions. Right. Well, in that moment too, you'd prepared the right part. You were going into what you guys had rehearsed. Totally. But your worship leader wasn't doing anything wrong. Like he's following and leading into the moment, but you're thinking like, okay, where are we going? Where are we at right now? And how can we connect these things? Right. And having to gauge in real time while continuing to play music. (laughs) Right, you're making these decisions. Yeah, and I feel like there's so many moments like that where, okay, are we staying on this song and we're having this this kind of moment? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm playing the next chord progression while he's talking. Right. Um, yeah, and so these these split second decisions. And so a lot of times I feel like we really do have to go with our gut on mm-hmm. those and which choice we wanna make. And the more you practice doing that, the easier it gets. Okay, so let's start off kind of with the really practical components. I think a lot of people think that all of these moments have to be completely spontaneous from the keyboard. Like you're expected to just pull everything out of thin air in the moment. But when we were talking about this before the video, I know that that's not really actually the case. There's a lot of forethought that goes into these moments, at least when you're preparing for them. So yeah. can you talk about how you like to think about it in advance and, and then kind of what that looks like in the real world? So the first thing I'm always doing is just listening to the songs that are on the set list, right? Like doing all the basic preparation, listening to the track, if I'm doing it that way, listening to parts and sounds and figuring out all of that stuff right up top so that I know what I want to do. The second thing that I'm doing is I'm really knowing the chord progressions that are in all of the songs. And I don't think that you have to intentionally memorize, but for myself, even from the first time I'm learning a new song, I'm thinking through, okay, what are the chord progressions? Is it the same for the whole song? Where is it different? Mm -hmm. And so if I engage my mind at the beginning of that process, by the time I've actually figured out all my sounds, all my melodies, I pretty much have the song memorized. Sure. Not only do I have it memorized, but I do know the chord progressions that are in all of these songs, and mm-hmm. I do have possibly even some alternate melodies that I really like, and all of that is fuel for any kind of spontaneous moment or anything else that might happen. So you, you know that you're gonna end up working on some more spontaneous or sort of back pocket moments, but you're focusing on the core ingredients first, the yeah, songs absolutely. that you know you're gonna be threading yeah. together. Yeah, exactly. So really the first step is just get into the set list itself, right. build up that confidence to be able to know, okay, these are the building blocks, mm-hmm. how can we make this more cohesive? Right, and for me, I really like to be able to contribute something unique and special, either from the sound perspective or from the melodic perspective, which mm-hmm. is why 
for me, I don't want to just show up and play some chords and see what happens. Like, I want to intentionally decide on some things to do and right. know where my space is. And based on my band, uh, depending on who else is going to be adding melodic content, but especially if I'm the only one playing melodically, I really want to bring something special to that time. Joe, I think it's so awesome that you emphasize wanting to bring something of excellence, right, from your contribution to the band and also thinking about what other people, other volunteers on the team are also going to be pouring their heart into. Really, I think the through line here is, is not just being concrete on the arrangements, being familiar with the songs themselves, but there's a lot of like heart behind it that goes into it from just a worship perspective. Could you talk about how that plays into your preparation as well? So after I've done all the fundamentals of going through the songs and making all these decisions and playing through chord progressions and feeling really comfortable, I like to sit down and just have a little time of personal worship too with God. And maybe that's the songs on the set. Maybe those are other songs that I was listening to that week. But mm -hmm. I just like to sing and play and worship and just have that time. because I feel like when I'm able to connect with God in that way, then I'm able to really come with the right heart posture when I enter onto the stage. Right. I think that makes a ton of sense and it's it's also really important because when you go from practice at home to rehearsal with your band you might get pulled back into the practical components somebody else might bring a melodic idea that you have to change up your game plan and make space for or the song might not be clicking and you have to break it down to its you know individual components and build it back up a new song could be introduced during the rehearsal <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, you never know what that rehearsal is going to bring, but it's going to be practical and sort of focused on the band sound to some extent. Yeah, and I've found that especially during times, because I do like to have a plan and I do like to have the unique contribution, during times mm -hmm. where I already know, okay, we're going to medley some songs, or we are going to flow, or we're going to do more of a prayer set, then I know I can just sit down, worship, play through some songs, and I honestly feel really ready, like I'm, I'm ready to bring something, even though right. I don't know what that is is and I'm ready for God to surprise me with the melodies that come out. So if somebody's pretty new, maybe a little intimidated by this concept, not just preparing for songs, but also for those moments that are very vague, they can pop up at any, any time, uh, what would you say to somebody who's wanting to start out and be able to to rise to the occasion when that happens. Yeah, and especially because these moments do tend to just pop up out of nowhere, especially when you're first getting started. I remember the first few times that I was asked to do it and I just, my heart was racing because so I was like, you want me to do what? If you had right. told me about it, I could have planned something really amazing <laughs> and beautiful. And here I am in this moment and I'm like not comfortable. Right. And so the first thing I like to do is just have a couple of patches in my back pocket. And these okay. are ones that fill space it's to have pads or pianos and also to know that these are piano tones that you like. There's been times early on too where I would just pull up a random patch that had a piano and pads in there. Mm -hmm. And it and it wasn't my favorite piano and now I'm sitting playing it for minutes and, and just not enjoying it. Right. And so you can take the time and space at home to decide on patches you already like. And that way, if the moment should come up, you can just add it right in or pull it up quickly and you already know that you like those sounds. Right. Um, in a similar way, I also just like to have chord progressions in my back pocket. And so starting out, you can even just choose one set of three or four chords that you feel really comfortable playing. Mm -hmm. That way too, same idea. You just, you have that at the ready. And so when you're asked to do it, it's like, sure, great. I can totally do that right. instead of feeling some level of panic. Um, mm -hmm. And as you get to doing it more often, maybe you have a couple different progressions that you can move between just to keep things interesting. Right. So you're really kind of counting on these moments happening, even though yeah. you don't know when they're going to show up. What, if anything, do you find yourself focusing on once you get to rehearsal, when those moments of transition between songs are happening? What does that look like in a rehearsal context? I think one thing that you can do is just to pray for creativity. Ask mm. God to do new things during the service, if that's something that you guys are really looking to do. And take these moments where perhaps it's a transition between songs, perhaps it's underscoring. But instead of just playing chords, maybe see if you hear a melody. You might play something that you hear. Maybe a vocalist will hear some words to the melody that you're playing and they might start singing. Mm -hmm. It can always start with you. I really think that keys players are just as much worship leaders as the person on the front of the stage who's singing in the mic. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there's something cool that can happen that can start with you if you take a little ownership. And again, just depending on your band context and what you have permission right. to do. Right. Um, but some really cool things can happen. I think the other thing to do with your band is when you are transitioning with songs, to keep it simple sometimes. Yeah. Um, if you're playing a chord progression that's like four to six chords long and your worship leader is praying, that makes it really hard for them to jump back in smoothly. And so right. that's when they tend to jump 
in the middle of the progression and, and then it doesn't sound as nice. And so I would really be thoughtful about what's happening in that moment and maybe just stay on a one and a four, do like a cess chord, like a C to an F. Right. And just keep it really simple because if you do that, it makes it easy for other people to join in and it makes it easy for your worship leader to come back in. Okay, so Joy, could you just give us some practical examples? I'd love to hear you play a little bit of what this style of underscoring sounds like in the real world. Yeah, sure, of course. Two words that come to mind for me, you said a little bit like some permission, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have some boundaries and some shared yeah. understanding between you and the band leadership, your worship team leadership about where you can go. Right. And then there's also the other word that comes to mind is trust, where the rest of the band is sort of trusting you to not leave them behind or take the song or the moment somewhere where they're not going to be able to contribute. Right. That like there's really a lot going on behind the scenes in your head here. You're thinking about, okay, who's on the schedule this week? How talented are they at playing in the key we're in? How talented or comfortable are they improvising? Is this their first Sunday? Is this their hundredth Sunday? Have they played the song we're about to play or not? There's a really a, a sort of a weight of responsibility that we're taking on here. And that I think is why it can be so spooky for a lot of people, right? Because yeah. it is a make or break moment. But if we prepare our hearts at home, if we prepare our practical skills, build up that muscle memory, then we're way more likely to make that moment to rise to the occasion than to feel like we are hindering or getting in the way of the real ministry that can happen during those times. What are a couple things you'd say to somebody who's just starting out that they should maybe try to avoid when it comes to underscoring? Yeah, in general, I would say not to play busy, repetitive parts. Kind of like my so just story. Just like the story. <laughs> right, just like the don't, story. Don't do that. I typically would not <laughs> do that. So I felt like in that moment, I was breaking all my rules. So I really didn't right. know what to do. Right. <laughs> so a moment of crisis. But in general, <laughs> I think that, you know, also because what you're doing is trying to sort of set the tone for the prayer and really help people to focus their heart and their mind on whatever is being said by right. the speaker, the pastor. And so I tend to keep it simple and I just feel like this is really a time to not make mistakes as much as possible because if you hit right. a bad note, it just pulls everybody out of the moment that was already going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I really work hard not to do that. So this is really like a high stakes sort of environment, right? Like right. there's a lot of like quiet happening around whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, it is important to make sure that you're confident in whatever you're coming up with to do, especially if you are truly improvising. If you're coming up with stuff or recalling stuff, on the fly. But we also know we don't want people to shrink back or not push themselves at all because if you are not willing to take some steps into the moment to like be in the moment instead of under the moment only, then I think you're sort of diminishing your capacity to contribute and enhance, right? Yeah. Use the term safe risks at the very beginning of this video and I thought I want to just ask you how you would apply that term to this thought process where we're in a moment, the tone is being set by someone else and we're trying to match and enhance that tone, right? Maybe we've prepared regardless of how comfortable someone is. What's your thought process behind like, okay, I need to take a safe risk here. What does that look like? Yeah, and I think that goes back to even the preparation that happens at home, mm -hmm. because that's really setting the stage for showing up and then experiencing an overflow that happens. When I'm at home and I feel really comfortable with a number of melodies, and maybe not even a full melody, but like these are some starting notes in my progressions that I feel right. like I can begin with. Mm -hmm. And I am very confident in the scale of my key, and so I I know what all of these notes are. It's a key that I find it easy to play in. Yeah. Uh, when I have all that in place, then I am able to start simple. Just as, as I'm starting, maybe I'm playing just the same chord progression. And then I allow it to grow a little bit. And the way I think of it as a safe risk too is, I'm playing slowly enough that I'm able to keep up. It doesn't feel like it's moving really quickly or right. that I have to, I have that time and space to maybe explore developing it a little bit as it goes. So I've started with yeah. a little melody. Maybe I add on a bit. Maybe I do something different. Maybe I bring it down lower and I bring it higher. But the chord progression is moving slowly enough that I'm able to kind of do all of those things. And I yeah. feel confident that I can play and stay inside my key and all that good right. stuff. So you're kind of gauging where you're feeling in the key that you're in 
the time that you're in, like the, the speed of the song, the moment that's being created, making sort of an educated guess, right, right. at what you're going to be able to do, right. and then being comfortable saying like, you know, I've got time before this next chord change. I could do something really safe, mm -hmm. or I could try something that I know I've done before and that felt pretty cool. Maybe it feels good and you do it. Maybe yeah. you're like, mm, I'm gonna go around this progression one more time and then maybe I'll do it. And that's not a failure, yeah. right? Because you are sort of, you're having a dialogue with yourself in these moments to see what feels right. right. right? Setting yourself up for success and everybody in the room too. Right, and I think it's also really listening to, to the other people in your band because there are moments where I feel like I'm in a position to lead forward with a melody. There's mm -hmm. other times where the guitarist is already doing sort of an arpeggiated thing mm -hmm. or something with delays and I can just sit kind of underneath it right. or I can join in, I can hear the melody that's already happening. And so I think also just being aware of where are you leading and where are you following and being sensitive to that too. What's something else that people should avoid if they're brand new to this and wanting to build the skill set? Another thing that comes to mind is getting stuck in kind of fast moving progressions or really long progressions. If you're suddenly in this moment where a worship leader is saying a prayer or something like that, and you were in a previous song and it, it's really quick moving or it's got, you know, four or five chords, then it's really hard for them to be able to jump back in and join you when they're done praying. And so sometimes right. what happens is then they just come in in the middle of a chord and maybe it doesn't sound that great, but they just want to move on. They don't want the awkwardness of right. waiting to mm -hmm. get all the way around that progression. Right. So in those moments, I'm also really thoughtful and, and think, okay, maybe it makes more sense to just stay really simple, stay on the one, or mm -hmm. maybe do like a one, four kind of pattern because it's so much easier for other people to join in in your yeah. band as well as your worship leader to come back in. Yeah, so you're giving yourself an out if you need right. to go somewhere else to follow. Yes. And you're also giving everybody else on the team and on ramp to jump back into the song. I've been in situations where a chorus might have like, you know, four or eight lines and each line is a different chord progression. Like it's, it's right. really taking a long time to get back to the top. And the right. worship leader's focusing on praying. They're focusing on ministry. Yeah. They wrap the prayer, they say, amen, realize we're on line three out of eight. It's like yeah. 25 seconds before this refrain is gonna start again. <laughs> right. So in those moments, we really can sort of minister to our worship leaders yeah. by saying, let's not go into this 40 second long chorus and right. hope that they're paying enough attention to come back at the right moment. Yeah. Let's strip it way back to the one, yep. let's hang on the four and just leave that ramp open whenever they wrap up so yeah. that you can jump right back in. That's, that's really yeah. awesome. Joy, I love that this isn't just practical for you, right? There's musical intelligence at play for sure, but there's also a lot of heart. So what would you say to somebody who after watching this video really wants to make an effort to build out this skill? Yeah, and I would say if you haven't done this before, it's a great time to get started. You can keep it really simple and get all the confidence you need at home and really have something to bring to the stage. And if you guys want some more inspiration, even some specific altar call progressions that you can practice at home, we've got a full playlist of videos similar to this one that break it down in more detail. So if you'd like to check that out, there's a link in the description.